I'd like to get to our message here that is taken from Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 57 through 79, but I need to give you some background because we're kind of picking up in the middle of something that's been happening in the lives of two people named Zechariah and Elizabeth. This is first century uh, in uh, uh, Israel at the time, which is occupied by Rome, the Roman Empire. But these two Jewish people, um, Zechariah is a priest. That is, he is someone who serves regularly at the temple in Jerusalem, serving God, serving the nation as a priest. His wife, at this point, he and his wife are both very old. They have lived most of their life looking for, longing for a child, but Elizabeth has not been able to bear children. It's been an an ache in their hearts uh, as they've been together for a long time. They've prayed about that. Uh, They prayed fervently that God would break through and do that for them. Many of you know the pain of infertility. Uh, They experienced that. And later on in life, when they're very old, uh, Zechariah goes into the temple, and he's serving in the temple just like he's always done many, many times. But amazingly, and you can read all about this earlier in Luke 1 before our passage, an angel appears to Zechariah and says, God has heard your prayer. It seems really late uh, for God to answer this prayer, but he says, God is going to do a miracle. You know, I know you're older, but you and your wife, you're going to have a child. You're going to have a son, and you are to name him John. And Zechariah finds this pretty hard to believe, and so he questions the angel, how, how can I know that that's going to happen? And because he questions the angel, the angel responds back to him and says, because you don't believe me, even though I'm coming to you directly from God, from the presence of God himself, and you don't believe me, you're going to have a sign here that this is going to be true, not the kind of sign you really want. Zechariah, you won't be able to speak until your child is born. And so for nine months, Zechariah is unable to speak, and as we'll find out, apparently unable to hear as well. He loses both his ability to speak and to hear. And that is a sign that the angel gives to him uh, until we pick up here in our passage, Luke 1, 57 through 79. Remembering, this is God's word. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, Well, there's there's no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, And to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue set free and he began to speak, praising God. All the neighbors were filled with awe and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he said through his holy prophets of long ago. Salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show mercy to our ancestors, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death 
to guide our feet into the path of peace. Let's pray. Father, help us. Help us to hear you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that the word from you that you want to speak into each one of our lives, knowing every detail, every aspect of our hearts, of our minds, that uh, it hits its mark. And that we would then be filled with power from your Spirit, God, to obey what it is that you say to us. We want to be changed in this time. We're grateful for your word. So grateful, Lord. Um, we pray, God, that you would bless your word to our hearing now in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're, we're trying to track here in this series. We're actually just looking at some of what I call the songs that take place here in the uh, incarnation stories, the stories of God breaking through into world, becoming one of us, and how people respond to that. There are various songs that take place. Last week we looked at how Mary broke into song uh, as she experienced God at work in her life. Today, this is Zechariah's song. And my goal in this series is to try to help us to take what I know, this is kind of every, every pastor's nightmare, is when you're trying to preach a text that I'm pretty sure some of you can say, I think this is like the 120th time I've heard this passage and this verse because every Christmas they bring this stuff out and we all know the story. And the problem is a lot of the people who are experiencing this for the first time, they know a lot about God. They know what God is about, all of that good stuff, all that information, they know it. But something happens from the time they first experience what God is doing to when they sing. That's why we call this series A Hope That Sings, because there's something that changes. It's not just information anymore. It sinks all of 18 inches down to their heart, to their real soul, and they, they are suddenly able to take what they already know, but experience it in a new way, a fresh way. That's my prayer for us this Advent season. We go through these songs, but we learn again, how can I get this fresh experience of joy so that it's not just knowing about God, but knowing Him, knowing Him in this real and powerful way. So we're looking at some of these things, and with Zechariah today, I want to look at uh, three things, uh, three aspects of what happens in his life here. And the first one is the most obvious. I don't want to miss this. Uh, this would be the most obvious reason why Zechariah goes from where he is when God's first speaking to him to singing here later on in our text. And that is, joy comes for him after, after not before, a step of obedience. When he does something that he was told to do by the angel, name your son John, and when that time takes place where Zechariah makes it clear his name is John, it's a step of obedience that Zechariah takes, and that opens his mouth. It sets his tongue free the obedience in walking the way that God wants him to be. So the most obvious point to start out here this morning is that if you are struggling with, yeah, the joy of the Lord, the joy of my salvation, yeah, it's a phrase, it's a word, but I don't really, I'm not experiencing that, I'm not um, seeing that happen. One of the areas for us to consider, every one of us, this would be a blockage stopper uh, for joy in our lives is, is there that one thing that you already know God wants you to do. It's not a mystery. What does God want me to do, his will and all that? You already know God wants you to do it, and you don't really want to do it, and you kind of wrestle with God with that, and you, you argue with God a little bit. This actually just happened about a week or so ago for me, and it was a small thing. It really was. It, I'm not going to get into the details, but God put something before me where he wanted me to, I knew right away, I should do this. I, I, it's a, a small act of service. Obviously, I don't think anybody would even know if I didn't do it. And that's how I started my argument with God. I was like, it's one, God, it's my day off. And I really, I just want to relax. I don't want to, and God's putting this on. I want you to go, I want you to do this. I want you to go serve. And I start arguing with God and I'm wrestling with him. And I do that a lot of times walking and pacing. And so I'm, I'm kind of walking through the house and thank God for my wife, Laura, because She's sitting there, she's, she's watching and listening to it, because I'm doing this out loud at some point where I'm like, 
oh, I, I don't know. It's not really necessary for me to do this, is it? I can't, I, this just seems like it'd be, I could put this off. Somebody else could do this. It's not that big of a deal. And then I'd walk out of the room for a while and I'd stew on a little bit. I'm trying to do other stuff. No joy. There's no joy happening here because I'm wrestling with it. And I come walking back in and I just can't believe this is just silly. Why, I don't, I I don't want to have to do this right now. And I did this about four or five times and Laura just listens. She doesn't say anything. I, you know, I, I didn't really ask her a question, but she's just listening. But finally, I thought I'd done that enough that I had God cornered because I thought I, thought I could rely on my wife. I thought, now I've laid my case out enough here. If I just flat out ask her, Laura, do you think I should do this or not? That I, I didn't actually put it this way, but God knows it was a thought in my head. If Laura says, no, it's no big deal, put it off, then I'm going to say, gotcha, God, because I don't have to do it then. My wife said I don't have to do it, I don't need to do it. And I, I come to Laura and I say, so do you, what do you think? It's like half an hour after this. What do you think? Do you think I should go do this? And Laura says, it sure sounds like you think you ought to go do this, she said. <laughs> and, and right away, I knew it right away. It's like, ah. Oh. So I go and I do this small, I'm, I mean, this is, a, this is a small, you guys do much bigger things than that. This is just a small little thing. And I did it, and as soon as I did it, then the joy. As soon as I did it, the joy. If you're struggling with God, the breakthrough for joy for you is going to be when you finally say, I surrender, God. Okay, I'll go do that. Even though you don't feel qualified, even though it's inconvenient, even though you say, ah, oh, somebody else can do this, but God has called you and you have been fighting him and wrestling him and he is faithful to hang in there and say, I know you don't really want to do this, but do it because the moment that you do, there's a breakthrough. You can't really have joy, in fact, until we say yes to what God is calling us to do. It's interesting, we think of obedience, I think, in very negative terms here. Oh, i got to obey. What if we switch the way that we think about obedience this way? I, I was reading this fascinating story. It actually happened three, four years ago over in England. There was a guy named John Wildey, and he had a friend who flew airplanes, just a little single-engine Cessna airplane. And he would t his friend would take him up flying every once in a while. He gets in the plane for a plane ride with his friend. It's a beautiful day. They've been flying for most of the day when suddenly his friend slumps over and dies of a heart attack. They're up in the air. John Wildey has never flown in his life, never, never piloted a plane, doesn't know the first thing about it. Imagine yourself in this situation. So he, he gets on the radio. He's, mayday, mayday, I need help, I need help. My pilot is unconscious. He didn't know he'd actually died at that point. My pilot's unconscious. I, I, I'm up in this airplane, and I am not a pilot. And lo and behold, an air traffic controller gets a hold of the message. They quickly bring in a flight instructor to the tower, and this flight instructor begins to talk to John Wilde. He basically tries to teach him how to fly in real time while he's up there. Can you imagine the first? So he's, he's trying to have him just do some basics. Hey, let's, let's go ahead. We're going to need you to learn how to turn the airplane, how to bank it. And so he says, as I start to do that, he overdid it, and he ends up in a spiral going down. Somehow he pulls out of that. He's got to practice those things. They're trying to help him to figure out directionally where he's at. How do you know what your speed is, your height? All of these things. And now it's getting really complicated because now it's dark. So now he has to learn to fly by instruments only. He's going to have to learn to land an airplane for the first time ever in the dark. And he said, the whole time, though, here is this flight instructor, and I've got my headphones on, and he is talking into my ear. Hey, John, how's it going? You're doing a great job, John. Man, it's fantastic. Now, John, here's what I want you to do. I just want you to see that one knob there? Go ahead and turn that knob a little bit. You see, I want you to pull back on that stick just a little bit. John, and all the, all the way through, he said, this flight instructor is just telling me everything I need to do. He said, finally, he, they got down. It took him three times to try to land, but the third time he got down, ended up in a little bit of a grassy area off of the runway, but safe, he got down safely. I was reading about this, and he's like, well, what's it like having a guy in your head, literally, who's barking out or telling you these commands over and do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that? He said, oh. he said it, was, it was amazing. He said, because I knew that my life depended 
on me listening to everything he said. And I thought, what would change if we, when we talk about obedience with God, if we stop thinking about it as, oh, a groveling kind of thing, I got to do what God wants me to do, wouldn't it be different if I heard God speaking in that way where I realized every command that God gives me is not random? God's not like making up things to do. It's not busy work, but that God is saying, I want you to turn your life this way because your life depends on it. You can get into real trouble if you don't listen to what I'm doing. I'm doing this because I love you, because I care about you. Wouldn't it change the way that we hear God's commands? My life depends on hearing this. But we convince ourselves, I can fly this crazy old thing by myself. This guy in my head, I don't need these voices. I'll just do it myself. We wonder why our lives are spinning out of control. God says, I'm giving you these commands so that you will have joy in knowing that you are getting the best life possible. Zechariah experiences that. In a sm- he's like, well, that's a small kind of obedience. His name is John. It's a big deal. We're going to show you why here with these other two uh, areas of joy breaking out in Zechariah's life. Here's the second one. Joy comes when you can receive discipline from God as love. He mentions in his song, Zechariah does, to rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. So he mentions this, how to worship God, how to serve God without fear, and he talks about enemies. Now there's a couple levels to this because on the most obvious level, Zechariah is talking kind of on the more national scope. He's saying, look, God's people, Israel, they are, we are in bondage to the Romans. They've occupied our land. We have to serve them. And we're able to have some freedoms to worship, but it's always with fear because the Roman Empire has made it clear that at any time they can come into the temple area. They can do whatever they want. They have power over us. So we can't really serve without that fear because of our enemies. So on kind of a national level, you have here Zechariah saying God cares about us as a people. And he's freeing us not only from that enemy, but we would say in the biggest scope, forget the Roman Empire, what about the greatest enemy, death? That enemy that always gives us a little bit of fear in the corner of our lives that says, "Uh, but no matter what you do, here comes death. And here Zechariah is saying, even that enemy, God is going to free us from that fear. So we can serve him without that fear. He overcomes our enemies. But on the second level, and this is the more powerful one, that I see here happening for Zechariah is a personal level. There's a personal amount of fear that Zechariah has here that he is singing now that God can overcome in my life, my particular fears. You're like, well, what is that? Well, I think there's some fear that happens because when he's in the temple and he says to God, I don't believe you, says to the angel, and God says, now you will be unable to speak that wouldn't that change your picture of God kind of in a heartbeat? I find it actually kind of ironic. Zechariah is a priest, which means he's in God's house all the time. He he serves, and he's old, so he's done this for years and years and years, and suddenly, in the middle of him serving God, he is surprised because God shows up. Isn't it ironic that we can come to worship You can be, oh gosh, Cliff, I can't tell you how many worship services I've been a part of. If I numbered them all, it'd be so many that we come to worship and we do our worship thing, but sometimes we never actually expect that God's going to show up. Like if he did, it would shock us the way it did Zechariah. Whoa, whoa, hey, what are you doing in here? Well, I'm from God. God sent me. I'm the angel Gabriel. He sent me for a message for you. What? This, is, this, is out of, this isn't in the bulletin. Wait a second. You can't kind of do that stuff. This is out of order. This is not what God is supposed to do. Yeah, God doesn't go by those kinds of things. He's going to actually interrupt your life anytime he pleases because he's got things that he wants you to be a part of, and it unsettles Zechariah. I mean, it does because it's an angel, first of all, and that every time we read that in Scripture, it's never... Nobody ever, ever says, hey, can we get a selfie here? It's me and the angel, you know, can we do that? Nobody does that. Why? Because they're down on the floor, they're shaking, they're terrified. And the first thing the angels always have to say is what? You know, don't be afraid. It's okay. I know I'm powerful and imposing. You should see God. 
I'm coming from his presence. I'm nothing in the presence of God. Don't be afraid. Well, it's hard not to be when you just kind of show up, God, and interrupt. God says, well, let me tell you why I've come and interrupted your time of worship here. I have a word for you. You're going to have a son. And this hits right at a deep fear. See, because Zechariah and Elizabeth have prayed about this all their lives together. God, give us a son. Give us a child. Nope. No answer, no answer. And when the angel comes up and he says, God has heard your prayer. Again, if you're Zechariah, you're thinking, I prayed that prayer like the last time I prayed that prayer was 30 years ago when we were younger, when it was actually viable, when we could have done something about that. But now it's too late. Some people, are. if you read these stories, you're like, hey, that sounds really familiar. Zechariah's kind of response to the angel to Mary's, right? In fact, look at those side by side. Zechariah, when the angel comes to him and says, God's going to do this miracle on you, he says, well, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. Mary, same angel, by the way, Gabriel, shows up for Mary, and what's her response when he says, you are going to bear a son, the son of God? She says, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Now, I don't want to parse that out too much, but that looks pretty close, doesn't it? They're both asking how, what's going on, how is this going to be? Mary doesn't get any kind of discipline or punishment out of her question, but we're specifically told that the angel says, Zechariah, your answer sounds like just a normal kinds of question, but I know that underneath is unbelief. See, it's really hard to diagnose unbelief by the externals. It really is. You can say the same words, you can say the same things, but God knows the heart. And he's saying, Zechariah, it's not just a question. You're not just asking the details like Mary is. You're asking, you're not actually even asking. You're saying, this can't happen. Not possible. And the unbelief is why God says, this unbelief, I'm going to discipline you. I'm, I'm going to cause you to not be able to speak or hear until your son is born. And that, that's a shocker. That's a shocker for a lot of people. Hey, God doesn't do that. That's not the kind of God I know. He would never discipline like that, would he? Zechariah may have had to shift gears too and say, wow, just like C.S. Lewis said in his Chronicles of Narnia, well, God is not safe. He's good, but he's not safe. God is not going to be controlled by us, and God, in fact, will do things. Now, be careful here. Be careful. We've said this many times. The scripture is clear. There is not just one answer for suffering that we experience in this life. The book of Job makes that abundantly clear. Do not give just one answer for why suffering. Why did this happen? But you can also be very clear in Zechariah's case, we know exactly why this has happened. The angel said so. This is God's discipline to you, Zechariah. Can you receive it? as discipline with love. Now, before we get too hard on Zechariah, I want you to understand this. One, how scary would it be to lose your voice completely, not able to talk? How scary would it be not to be able to hear? And by the way, I'll give him some props here because he did a good thing here when the angel says, hey, this is going to happen, and he says this, hey, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. I'll give him props because he calls himself old, but he calls his wife not old, but a very great, she's, she's very gracefully, she's just kind of advanced in years, and he does a really good job of not blowing it here. He says, look, my wife is a little bit, you know, just along in years. How is this going to happen? So it's a natural kind of question again. But secondly, you can understand why Zechariah would be really, really afraid, because if this is true, then God, I have to get my hopes back up again. You see, because we've spent our whole lives having our hopes here and having them crushed. Every prayer we prayed that did not get the answer of having a child brought us right back down. And you're asking me, God, you're telling me to get our hopes back up because you're really going to make this happen now that I'm old and she's a, that's what you're asking. It's fearful. That's a scary thing. And furthermore, he's going to have to tell Elizabeth this. 
And by the way, this is very complicated when you think about it. When does he lose his voice? He loses his voice in the temple talking to the angel because when he comes out of the temple, he can't speak. And all the people are like, well, something must have happened in there. I don't know. And, and I guess he saw an angel or had a vision. And so from that point on, he can't speak. And we learn later in our text that he actually uses a writing tablet. Now, in the, in the first century, they would have had what would have been like, they, like a wax tablet, would have had a kind of a wooden frame, and it would have had wax on it. They would have had a stylus in which they could make marks in this wax. It's, it's kind of one step up, you know, from your Etch-a-Sketch and maybe two step, steps down from your iPad somewhere in there, technology-wise. So he's able to take this stylus. One end of the stylus has kind of this, this point to it. You could make a mark. The other end of it had kind of a widened part that you could kind of erase by scraping it over it. If you really wanted to, and this, by the way, this is actually the origin of this phrase, if you wanted to have a clean slate, you would take this wax tablet and put it near a fire. It would melt the wax and make it all smooth again. So this is how he had to communicate. Can you imagine this? He comes out of the temple. You're going to have a son. You can't talk now because God is disciplining you. He's got to go home to Elizabeth, and you're trying to sign this out. You're trying to, give me the, give me the tablet, and he, st he starts... Elizabeth, don't know how to say this. I think we should be intimate tonight. <laughs> Hands it off to her. Elizabeth, what? She asks, what are you? What are you God told me that we should make love tonight. She takes it. Nice try, old man. That's what she's saying. <laughs> You know, that's kind of the line there. I mean, you got to imagine. She's saying, are you crazy? We're, 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 you're old. I'm just elderly, long in my years. But there's no way that this is, he's got to tell her, no, this is real. God is, but he's afraid. Because it's one thing. He might be saying, look, I don't mind God if you drag my hopes up there and it gets dashed once again. Don't ask me to get my wife's hopes up there again. I have seen the pain in her eyes. I have seen how people look at her in the community because especially in that time, she was seen as a deficient wife. She was seen as the problem. And you're asking me to tell my wife to put her hope and her trust in what you're telling us, and that is too fearful of a thing. And yet, he does. Did you notice in our text that when they first are saying, what should we name this child? It's, a, it's Elizabeth who says, John, how does she know that? Only because Zechariah said, step of faith. Elizabeth, as hard as it is to believe, as crazy it is, God's going to do this in us. We've got to believe. We've got to trust. And that, facing this fear. But now, he also has to look at it in terms of, when I didn't believe, God disciplined me. Is that a mean God? Is that a capricious, arbitrary God who's better watch out or the, the bolt of lightning is going to get you? But for nine months of not being able to speak, nine months of silence, he's watching the miracle of his elderly wife as she grows with a baby and saying, only God, only God could do this. And he can't say it out loud, but he's saying, I believe, Lord. Of course, I believe now. It's amazing what you're doing. And I can see that my silence as scary as it is, as hard as it is for you to punish me, is a loving and merciful thing. And if you want joy, and if I want joy in my life, you know what we have to do? We have to bring those two together. I have to believe that if God is working discipline in my life, it's always out of love, and he's able to pull those two things together. It's like you can't even speak. You can't even hear. I know, but God is good. God is good. I'm seeing what God is doing. I see that this is, this is love, a hard love in my life. But it is love. Isn't this the spirit of what Hebrews 12 is talking about? My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves. And he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. This is one of the greatest joys ever, is that I have to think that Zechariah is saying, I blew it. 
I, I had my chance with the, with the angel. I could have said like Mary, let it be unto us as you've said. But instead I said, I don't really believe. I didn't use those words, but it was in my heart. God saw it. I don't believe you, God. And when that happened, God brought a punishment. But I knew that I blew it. And now over nine months, I could see this amazing truth. Here's joy. You can blow it. You can mess up. You can fall short. And there is enough grace for you to know, and I'm still included. I messed up, but God did not jettison me. I blew it, but God did not say, I'll find another couple. I messed up, but God's grace is so big and he's so powerful, he can take screw-ups like me and make me a part of what he is still doing. I didn't bring it all crashing down. Isn't that a great thought this morning that you can go out there and you can really mess up for Jesus and he can say, hey, I got it covered. My plan is still in place. Of course, he doesn't want you to kind of purposely go out there, but he wants to say, don't ever doubt because you've had a wrong turn in your life. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say this. I, I made a wrong turn years ago, Cliff, and that defines the rest of my life. No, it doesn't. Not in Christ. Not when you see a God who takes a guy who flat out says, I don't believe you, God, and God disciplines him, but he says, but you're still a part here. You have opportunities here, Zechariah. I'm not done with you. He was disciplined, but not rejected. He was rebuked, but he was not dismissed. He messed up, but God was still using him for this greater plan. I think he sees it. I think he gets it. So when he says, I can serve God without fear, he may have to discipline me, but it's always going to be in love. I can trust him. Here's the last thing. I think he finds great joy in knowing that it's not really about him. He knows, God has said, your son, John, is going to be great. I mean, God is going to use him. He is going to become the, the forerunner for the Messiah himself. People are going to recognize God's hand on your son's life. And the whole time, you might be thinking, Elizabeth and Zechariah are like, yeah, but what, what about us? What, what about me? What, am I, am I going to be well known? Well, you're going to get like in the first chapter of Luke 1, and that's about it. You get no other verses really. There's nothing, no other references to that. You, you're just kind of at the very beginning. And then John, there's a lot about John, your son. But I think he finds great joy in knowing, hey, that means God has called Elizabeth and I to be a supporting role in his kingdom. Because God has made it very clear your son's going to be great, but he's going to need you to raise him. And he, the angel back earlier in, in Luke 1 specifically said, don't let him drink any fermented drink, no wine. That's another specific way in which to raise him. A Nazarite vow is what it was called. And it meant kind of set apart for God for special service. And he's going to need you, Zachariah and Elizabeth, to learn how to walk in the way of the Lord. And that's your role. Question is, are you okay with that? Are you joyful with the role God has given you? Or is there a part of your heart that says, oh, nobody knows what I do, and it's, it's not very satisfying because nobody... You're standing in line now. To, you know, we're all shopping in different times. You, you stand in line at the grocery store or whatever. You see those crazy magazines. It's not real edifying reading, but as you're watching the, the covers of these magazines, you see People Magazine. I read this interesting thing. When it first began, People Magazine, they had, and I think they still do, editing guidelines. They said, look, to get on the cover of People magazine, you have to meet certain criteria. And this is the way they listed it out. Young is better than old. Pretty is better than ugly. Rich is better than poor. TV is better than music. Music is better than movies. Movies are better than sports. Anything is better than politics. And nothing is better than a celebrity who has just died. And you say, wow, that's a pretty harsh assessment of who has value. The only people who have value to us to put on the cover, I would love to see People magazine on the cover, a, a farmer, you know, a, a teacher, 
somebody that is toiling and laboring in obscurity that nobody else in the whole world knows on the cover of People magazine, but it will never happen because that culture, that idea, that lie says your worth, your value is only defined by how successful you can be and how many people know you. And it's especially good for us if you die because then we really get to get some sales out of the, out of the magazine. Here's the truth that Zechariah is embracing and this is where he finds his joy. I know nobody's going to remember. They're going to talk about my son. And that's okay. Because here's what I noticed about God's kingdom. There's no small roles. No small roles in God's kingdom. We think it is. We, we think, well, the reason we don't want to be second fiddle on this whole deal is because the person who serves in obscurity misses out, right? So you get your family get-togethers. Somebody's got to do the dishes, right? Who's going to toil away in the kitchen while everybody's doing table talk and laughing and playing games in the living room and the dining room? And you're like, I'm missing out. See what happens. I, I serve in obscurity. I miss out over here. You do all the work. Everybody else gets to play. And here's the way we think of it then in God's kingdom. We think, yeah, I'm, I'm going to miss out if I serve as a Sunday school teacher up and away in the room. Nobody sees me. Nobody knows what's going on up there. Surely I'm going to miss out and God says, yeah, but in my kingdom, you never miss out. Why? Jesus says, well, here's this amazing thing. The last shall be first. See, the last shall be first. And here's the way it works, he says. When you serve, if you serve according to the gospel. See, the opposite of religion is the gospel. Religion says, I serve, therefore God will accept me if I, do, if I serve well enough, right? That's religion. The gospel says, no. God has accepted me by grace, therefore I serve. So you receive first. That's why the Bible says we love because he first loved us. He says you never miss out in the kingdom because you receive first before you serve. So you can take any role that God assigns you and places before you, and you can say, I'll take it, God, even if no one else knows because I know I've already received first from you. And then... It goes further because God says, and it can be even the smallest thing because in God's kingdom, he takes the smallest things with his power and does extraordinary things. It's the only way to make sense when Jesus says, look, if somebody gives a cup of water, it's Donut Sunday, you're all sugared up a little bit, I can see it, your, your, your pupils are dilated a little bit here, so, and when you go out there, you're like, well, a cup of water is nothing. If I said, would you get somebody a cup of water? You're like, well, it's no big deal. You're just a little cup of water. What's the big deal? And Jesus makes a big deal about it. He said, if anybody gives someone just even a cup of water in my name, in other words, they're serving out of the love that I've given them, they will certainly not lose their reward. They will be blessed. There will be joy that overflows. But it's just a cup of water. Do you know what God can do with a cup of water? It's incredible. At World Vision, World Vision is a fantastic Christian relief organization that has done more, I believe, than any current organization to help relieve the poverty of people around the world who live in unthinkable conditions. And Richard Stearns is the president of World Vision. And he said there is one man at World Vision, a staff member, who has probably done more to combat world hunger and the ravages of poverty than anyone else. And nobody knows him. He says he's a staff person named Steve Reynolds. Nobody knows that name. He's not been on the cover of People magazine. He says Steve Reynolds has done more. And you say, well, how? Well, he got on staff in 1985. And shortly after that, he served on the ground in Ethiopia during one of the worst uh, famines that they've ever experienced there. And he's helping the poorest of the poor in Jesus' name. And he said, while he's there, there's a couple that heard about World Vision and wanted to see what it was about. And he said, this couple is Paul and Allie Hewson. And he said, this couple came. They wanted to spend time with Steve Reynolds working in Ethiopia. So they spent several months, actually, working side by side with him. After a couple months, they left. Steve continues to serve to this day with World Vision. He said, but the amazing thing is that couple, and maybe you know the name differently than Paul Hewson, it's actually um, Bono. 
lead singer for U2. If you don't know that group, that's okay. But Bono is, is the one who has spent more time with governments all over our globe and been able to get billions of dollars of aid to where it's needed most. And in an interview, you know what Bono said? He said, none of this would happen. You see me out there, and the, the, he's on cover of People magazine, and he gets all the press when he goes to these places and gets this kind of aid going. He said, but none of this would have happened except for a guy named Steve Reynolds. He said, because our time with Steve Reynolds back in the late 80s, as he's working in Ethiopia, changed our lives, changed the way we looked at things. He said, his influence is exactly why we're doing what we're doing. You see how God can take one cup of water, and Steve Reynolds will probably, his name will never be known in any of the lights or promotion things, but here's the thing. He is joy. He doesn't have to be known. He's saying, ah, it's, it's about serving the king. And if he puts me in this role, and that's a question, can you embrace the role that God has given you with joy and saying, I don't care if no one else knows because I'm serving the king. By the way, Zechariah and Elizabeth, I think, take that, their approach themselves, but they also invest that into John. I can say that because after John grows up, and John becomes kind of a celebrity star. If there was a People magazine in the first century, he would have probably been on it at one point because so many people went to John to be baptized, and he caused a stir throughout the land. He was very political in the way that he spoke. Hey, political leaders, you guys are out of line. You better repent. He, he drew a lot of press and a lot of followers. And then Jesus comes along, and he baptizes Jesus, and Jesus goes off, and next thing you know, John's saying, you should go follow him. You, you, you should go, and lots of people do. Lots of people do. So that John's disciples say, hey, that's not right. Hey, that, that's not fair. He comes along later. He's grabbing all of our guys. Our attendance levels are going way down. What is the problem here? John, we can't just let this happen. And John's response is classic. He learned this, I'm sure, from his parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth, who said, hey, son, embrace the role God gives you. Listen to what he says in John 3. John replied, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I am not the Messiah, but I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater. Jesus must become greater. I must become less. It's a beautiful moment where he says, God takes the smallest things if we offer them with this assurance, God is good. Oh, he loves me. He's made me a part of his kingdom plan, and it may seem small to you, but I know it's part of something huge. God takes the smallest offerings, makes the biggest things out of them. That's to his glory. He must become greater. We become less. Let's pray.